so, second talk um, given by Tico about program analysis um, with SMT solvers. Right, thank you. Yeah, so uh, it looks like there's no microphones. I'm just going to have to speak up a bit. Uh, if you can't hear me, just please, please tell me. Um, so I'm going to be giving a kind of broad introduction to SMD solvers and one specific way uh, in which we can use SMD solvers to analyze programs and to answer kind of relatively complicated questions about programs we've written. But the first thing that we need to talk about, of course, is what an SMD solver is. And I know that they don't really come up in the usual computer science curriculum, which I think is a real shame. Now, at heart, SMT solvers are a particular kind of constraint satisfaction solver. So you set up a problem with a whole bunch of variables, a whole bunch of constraints over the variables, and then the solver either finds some set of values for each variable that satisfy all the constraints, or it tells you that the constraints are not satisfiable. One of the most common kinds of constraint satisfaction problems that people are familiar with, and I think this might be the hello world of constraint satisfaction, is uh, Sudoku. So the idea is, if we wanted to encode this as a constraint satisfaction problem, we would create a variable for every single missing box, and we would create constraints based on which other numbers are already defined for each row, for each column, and inside each box. Now, this kind of constraint satisfaction problem is, in the kind of greater sense, relatively easy, so you don't need a particularly sophisticated <laughs> solver. The thing that SMT solvers give us is a much larger constraint solving capability, which we can then scale up to large problems that are based on the semantics of, pro uh, of actual programs, which in turn let us automatically prove useful properties about our programs, uh, find vulnerabilities, find bugs, and do all kinds of interesting analysis. So I'm just going to be talking later on about one particular technique, but ultimately SMT solvers are a kind of very general very flexible tool. And there are a lot of really cool projects going on today which use SMT solvers in very different ways. Uh, one of my favorite ones, which you can actually use today, is called Liquid Haskell. Now what Liquid Haskell does is it lets us encode refinement types for Haskell. So types that actually have logical predicates. For example, the type of ordered lists or the type of numbers that are multiples of three. And normally, if you were encoding this kind of more complicated type in, for example, a dependently typed language, you would have to manually prove that your program actually had the properties in the type. And in practice, this is very difficult. And what Liquid Haskell does by discharging the proof obligation to the SMT solver is solve these things automatically, making these much more complicated and flexible types a lot more accessible to programmers who don't necessarily have the experience to write uh, in a fully dependently typed language. And another uh, really cool project I ran into is uh, a system that improves type error localization using SMT solvers. So this is, again, at the low level, it uses the same kind of constraint satisfaction logic uh, sort of problem, but it does something totally different. And in this case, what happens is that with uh, languages with type inference, like Haskell or OCaml, uh, we don't always know which part of the code caused an error. In fact, in languages with type inference, we can think of the type inference problem itself as being a big constraint satisfaction problem. And if you have a type error, we don't have a single location that's wrong. We have some set of constraints set up by your types that are mutually uh, contradictory. And so what this particular project did is it used an SMT solver and some kind of guided heuristic to basically find the smallest part of your program that if you fix, would fix the type error. And in practice, this actually did significantly better 
at finding the actual uh, location of the mistake, then the heuristics that the, in this case, OCaml compiler used to generate uh, type error messages. And I, in particular, what I liked about this project is that they followed this up with a user study that showed that at least for students learning OCaml, uh, having just better error localization significantly improved how quickly they would pick up the language. But this is also just a cool example of using SMT solvers in a way that is totally different from what I'm going to talk about. So when I get to, uh, to more details, it, it's, kind of, it's, it's easy to get lost in the specific technique I'm talking about, but that's just one possible way of using SMT solvers. And in a real sense, SMT solvers are this kind of lower level logical substrate that we can use to do a whole bunch of totally different, uh, sometimes seemingly unrelated things. So let's talk about what SMT stands for, or what an SMT solver is. Uh, and honestly, what it stands for doesn't make sense. So SMT stands for satisfiability modulo theories. But unless you're kind of already steeped in this part of computer science, and you already know what an SMT solver is, these words don't really tell you very much. In fact, they don't even read like uh, valid, valid English. Uh, so basically, there's really two important parts to this uh, definition. The first one is satisfiability. So satisfiability uh, is, or Boolean says satisfiability, is one of the traditional core NP-complete problems. And the way it works is that the satisfiability problem uh, asks us to provide a big logic for with a whole bunch of Boolean variables. So for example, here we have x1, x2, and so on, all combined with and, or, and not. And this kind of problem has been studied for a long time, uh, partly because it was one of the original NP-complete problems, and partly because it's actually often easier to prove that some new problem is NP-complete by reducing it to SAT as opposed to something else. And it also happens to be very good for modeling digital circuits. Unfortunately, in a very real sense, SAT is a very low level kind of constraint satisfaction problem because we're literally operating bit by bit. So when we build a kind of normal SAT formula, we're describing whatever logic we have with individual variables corresponding to a single zero or one in the whole program. And in practice, this makes it pretty difficult to express non-trivial problems in terms of pure set. So what SMT solvers give us is uh, extra theories, so extra kinds of logic that we can use in the same kind of uh, formula setup as a set solver. And the easiest way to think about it is that each theory gives us different kinds of variables. So instead of having a Boolean, we might have an integer, or we might have a real number. And it also gives us other kinds of constraints, like less than, and other kinds of operations, like addition. And with modern SMT solvers, there is a really long list of theories that you can use. And depending on the kind of problem you want to address, and the kind of actual formulas you generate, different theories are going to both give you different capabilities, but also uh, the theories you use can really determine how quickly the SMT solver can actually solve real-world problems. And so, for what uh, there's two theories I kind of want to call out here. For what I'm doing, bit vectors are the most useful. And essentially, a bit vector is just a fixed set of bits. So if you wanted to model a 64-bit word, you would model it as a 64-bit bit vector. And then another cool... Uh, theory that uh, was developed somewhat recently is this theory of floating point numbers. So there's this funny thing in the world of computers and verification, where we start with a problem that involves real numbers mathematically. Then, in order to run this efficiently on real hardware, we approximate real numbers using floating point numbers. But then, once we get around to wanting to prove properties of our program that is written in terms of floating point, it's a lot easier to reason about real numbers again. So we often end up approximating floating point with real numbers 
when we're doing verification. And the nice thing with uh, SMT solvers is that the theory of bit vectors is fast enough that we can actually express the semantics of floating point in terms of how they work on the actual bit representations of floating point numbers and solve non-trivial verification problems in terms of the actual semantics of floating point rather than trying to approximate them with real numbers. Okay, so the next question is we have these solvers, but why do we want to use this set of solvers specifically? What makes SMT special? So the first part is that SMT solvers are quite expressive. So you can think of SMT solvers as a restricted kind of logic programming. At a high level, it's kind of like a variant of prologue with some restrictions on the kind of constraints you can express and the data you work with, but it's still expressive enough to capture a lot of logic that we want to work with in a fairly intuitive sort of way. Of course, expressiveness isn't the only thing we want. We also care about performance. And SMT solvers are fast enough in practice to be useful for a lot of real-world problems, even though you wouldn't expect this uh, at first. And if you go back to where I started, talking about sat satisfiability as being one of the classical NP-complete problems, what I'm telling you here is that we have this nice solver that can solve an NP-complete problem. And you should take your domain, whatever you're working on, and encode it as an NP-complete problem and you know, actually run it, which normally is something that we never want to do. Usually the, uh, the common wisdom is that as soon as you found out you have an NP-complete problem, you should take a step back and figure out if you can you know, restrict the, the problem you're solving or approximate it, because normally NP-complete means it's infeasible. The surprising thing, though, is that SAT solvers and SMT solvers, despite attacking this large NP-complete problem, work surprisingly well in practice. And there's actually been some really fascinating research on SAT solvers specifically and why SAT solvers work. And I won't go into the details, but there's a wonderful paper about a tool called SATGraph that builds visualizations of SAT formulas. What they found is that for instances of SAT that come from real world domain problems, there's a lot of rich structure in the formula that doesn't exist for randomly generated SAT instances. And this kind of visualization shows you, here is one problem from a benchmark based on industrial uses of SAT, and here is a totally randomly generated SAT formula. And just looking at this picture, we can see that there's a lot more structure in the, the, the problem that comes from the real world than the one that's totally randomly generated. So the real way to think about SAT solvers and SMT solvers is not as oracles that magically solve an NP-complete problem really fast, but it's to think of them as solvers that can solve a somewhat ill-defined subset of SAT really fast, where that subset also happens to work really well with problems that people solve in the real world. And unfortunately, this is kind of a fuzzy relationship, and people are studying it in purely uh, empirical terms. So at the end of the day, they're fast because in practice, they're fast. <laughs> OK, so let's jump in and walk through an example of a simple way that we can take a program written in, let's say, a simple programming language and use an SMT solver to answer non-trivial questions about this program. And the particular uh, technique I'm going to talk about is a, a way that we can take a program in our little language and compile it to an SMT formula that represents the execution of the program symbolically. The idea with this formula is that we're basically going to have three sets of variables. We'll have one set of variables for the inputs to the program, one set of variables for all of the intermediate states as the program is running, and one set of variables for the final output of the program. If we have a formula like this, what kinds of things, what kind of questions can we answer using an SMT solver? 
The simplest question we can answer is we can uh, constrain the inputs. We can say the inputs to this program are A, B, C. What are the outputs? And in this case, we'd be using our SMT solver as an interpreter. And most likely, we'll be using it as an interpreter that's significantly slower than just a handwritten interpreter. But the neat thing with logic formulas is that there's no built-in notion of uh, sequence or time. The only kind of sequence we have is in the actual constraints we express in the formula. But from the solver's point of view, there's no fundamental difference between the variables that represent inputs and the variables that represent outputs. So just as we can set the inputs and solve for the outputs, we can set the outputs and solve for the inputs, giving us a reverse interpreter. And this is something that's a lot harder to do if you just wrote a program you know, trying to do it directly. And even for the SMT solver, in practice, going backwards is harder than going forwards. But it actually works in practice. And I've, actually, I've played around with the simple language I'll show you later. And you can write a reverse interpreter and actually solve for inputs that give a specific output. And one interesting property is that if some input exists, then the solver can usually find it pretty fast. But if there's no input, then it takes a solver a while to convince itself that it's impossible to find an input. And that's a kind of a good example to build intuition for which problems are going to be harder to solve and which ones are easier. It's always much easier to find that some solution exists than to exhaustively verify that no solution exists. And in general, it's going to be much easier to find a set of variables that satisfy constraints than to show that a set of constraints is unsatisfiable. Um, another thing we can do with the same formula is we can apply some logical constraint to every single intermediate state in our formula. <coughs> so remember, again, the intermediate states are just going to be variables, just like the inputs and the outputs. So if you have some invariant that we want to hold in the program, we want to ensure that some variable is never zero or some array index is never out of bounds, in our formula, we would just go through and add a constraint to every single intermediate state. And then if the formula is satisfiable, it means that our constraint holds. But if there's some logical contradiction, uh, it won't hold. And we'll be able to know that the assertion or invariant that we're checking uh, is not valid. Uh, and then another uh, kind of maybe the most general technique I'll talk about in detail is verification. So if we have two programs, or maybe we have like some kind of executable specification and a program, we can actually set up a formula that asks whether there exists some input such that the outputs of the program are different. And if we can find an input like this, we've not only shown that the two programs we're verifying are not compatible, we also have a concrete counterexample, which we can then use to uh, you know, generate a test case or continue kind of de interactively developing the, the program we're trying to uh, correct. So this high level idea of working with formulas is uh, relatively nice. But the question is, how much work would it take to write a formula compiler? And to demonstrate this in a, a small constraint setting, I'm going to show you how to write a formula compiler for this little uh, imp language. And uh, this is a language that I borrowed from uh, a course I took on semantics, because the language is designed to teach people uh, how to analyze programs, and it's intentionally simplified to do away with a lot of the incidental complexity that we get with a real language. So the idea with IMP is that we have a minimal imperative programming language. It has variables, but the variables are always integers. Uh, and then it also has the basic construct that you'd expect like while loops and if statements and assignments. This language by itself isn't enough to write too many interesting pr programs, especially because it doesn't include ar ar arrays. But it's still enough to write some uh, common algorithms like the uh, greatest common divisor. So 
the language is going to be broken up into two parts. And one way this language is simplified compared to real world languages is that expressions can't have side effects, they only have values. And then on the other hand, statements can have side effects, but they don't return a value. And in a real language, these two concepts tend to be a lot more intertwined. So here we're just keeping the separation to make our own job easier. So one thing that I really like about using a language like Haskell for this sort of task is that algebraic data types are a very natural construct for working with language grammars. So if we took the grammar of uh, arithmetic expressions and we wrote it out in ASCII based on its you know, a BNF notation, it would look quite a lot like perfectly valid Haskell code that we can then use for the, uh, the rest of our, our code. Uh, so here, by the way, as I said, we have the arithmetic expressions, which break down into variables, literal values, and you know, addition, subtraction, and so on. Uh, we would have uh, some kind of Boolean expressions that are very similar to the arithmetic, arithmetic expressions. And then finally, we have the set of statements that our language supports. And the statements are important because they'll be the heart of the formula compiler that we're building. And the, the important statements are being able to set a variable, being able to sequence one statement after another, uh, being able to do if expressions, and while loops. So the really neat thing with writing this formula compiler is that if you squint, the code for the formula compiler looks a lot like the code for a normal interpreter of the program. And the reason we have this relationship is that, in a way, the formula compiler is a sort of symbolic interpreter of the program. So we're running through a trace, but instead of executing a single trace, we're generating a logic formula that describes the trace of the program. So all the, all the code that I'm going to be talking about here specifically uses the Z3 SMT solver. And in practice, unless you have a really good reason to use something else, Z3 is the way to go. So when you see Z3 show up in, uh, in my code samples, it's referring to this specific solver. So the thing I actually kind of have not talked about yet is the fundamental limitation of this approach. So there's always a problem when working with programs, uh, which is that we really can't make any kind of strong conclusions about programs involving loops, because we immediately run into the halting problem. And in this particular case, the way that we're going to avoid that is by only considering programs uh, up to some bound on the number of iterations. So the general name for this technique is bounded verification. And what we're doing is we're essentially approximating the semantics of a Turing complete program by arbitrarily putting a limit on how long we're going to let the program run. In some cases, this kind of limitation is not practical. But a lot of the time, for real, uh, real applications, we can either set the bound high enough to be useful, or often, if a program ends up running too long, it'll be too slow anyway. So it's uh, fundamentally wrong in that sense. So the way we do the whole formula compilation is going to take three steps. The first step is we want to get rid of functions. And we'll do that by inlining all our function definitions. The next step is that we want to get rid of loops. And we do this by unrolling the loops up to some configurable bound. And then finally, we need to deal with assignments. And we do this by rewriting the program into single static assignment form, or SSA. And I'll go into details of what that means later. OK, so the first step, inlining. If we have some function with some body, then essentially all we do is we copy and paste the body of the function into the program. And once we've done this for every single function, we've gone from having 
a potentially complicated program full of interactions to having a single straight line program that's just a lot longer uh, than the previous version. The next step is unrolling. And again, if we have a loop, we rewrite the loop into this kind of if expression that checks the loop condition. If the loop condition holds, we do the body and we repeat. And so in a real case, uh, when we do this, we end up with something like 100 or 1,000 nested ifs or more, depending on the bound. So you'd never want to write this by hand. But this does a good job of approximating the meaning of this while loop just in terms of a bounded number of if statements. You do the same for inlining a recursive function? Right, exactly. So if you, if you had a recursive function and we needed to inline it, we would also need some way of bounding the amount of recursion we do. And we'd do that by inlining it at most n times. And then what you can usually do here is once you get n, n levels deep and you've hit your bound, you can just mark a failure condition with a message in the SMT solver that says this formula failed because you hit the, the bound you set in the formula. And so in practice, if you're building a tool, you have multiple choices of what to do. You can either tell the user that, hey, your program ran, ran too long, so we can't verify it. Or you can actually go back and rerun the same formula with a longer bound. So there's always some amount of flexibility in how you use these techniques to actually build useful tools. And then the final step is single static assignment. So what we want to do is we want to take our mutable uh, imperative program and turn it into something that looks like a functional program. So each time we have an update, we actually create a new variable with a new name for each step of the program. So in this example, we have a couple of variables defined at the beginning, and then we update x to be some new value. When we rewrite this into single static assignment form, we instead have two variables, x0 and a0. And then the updated value of x is given a new name, x1. And we do this for the entire program, which is what lets us go from a program updating in place to a larger program with different names for essentially every single step in the program. And the one place where this gets pretty tricky is dealing with uh, branching and if conditions. So if we have some kind of branching, then we statically don't know which of these two branches was taken. So we don't know how many updates happened here or what logic went on. Once once we're outside the if statement. And what we do in this case is, in some sense, we almost punt on the whole problem, and we create something called a, a, a phi node, which essentially says that the value x3 is equal to x1 if we took the first branch, or x2 if we took the second branch. Now, when I learned about a single static assignment form in compilers, it almost felt like this phi node thing was a bit of a cop-out. feels like magic. Uh, in the case of SMT solvers, it turns out that this uh, phi node maps directly to a built-in construct, which expands into a formula that literally says, if some condition, then this value, else that value. It's called an ITE, or an if-then-else. OK, so now that we have this rough idea that we want to uh, turn a program into a formula. Let's take a look at the parallels between how we would write a normal interpreter and how we would write the formula compiler. Um, so for arithmetic expressions, we want to be able to go from an expression like 5 plus x to an SMT formula that says something like, you know, add two bit vectors, uh, a bit vector that's a literal five, and a bit vector that's x. And, I mean, if you squint at this code, it's kind of hard to tell that they're doing different things. In the top version, in the interpreter, we just uh, recursive, to do addition, we just recursively calculate 
the values of the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and we add them. In the case of the formula compiler, we build a formula for the left-hand side, we build a formula for the right-hand side, and then we build a bigger formula with an addition node that represents the whole expression. Uh, assignment statements are basically just assertions. And in Z3, an assertion is similar to just adding a new clause into the big logic formula. So if we say something like x equals 5 plus x, in the case of Z3, once we've done the SSA transformation, we just add an assertion that says x1 is equal to 5 plus x0. And again, in the code, the interpreter version would just look up the latest value of the variable, and the Z3 version would look up what iteration of x we're on. So are we x1, x2, x3? And then it would create the uh, arithmetic expression the same way we talked about it. It would assert that the new value of x, whatever, n plus 1, is equal to this previous one, and then we'd kind of update the new variable x in our scope. Uh, and then, as I said, if, uh, if conditions get compiled to these phi nodes, and this works out in practice because uh, the Z3 formula just has this if-then-else sort of construct, um, in this case, the parallel with the interpreter kind of falls apart a little bit, and we need to do a lot more bookkeeping in the formula compiler. But essentially what we do is we compile the parts of the if, and then for every single variable that we're working with, we add a node that says something like, if we took the left-hand side of the if, this is the new value. And if we took the right-hand side of the if, this is the new value. And then we don't have to do anything for loops, because once we've unrolled the loops, we don't have them in the language anymore. OK, so we have this formula. And the question is, what can we do with it? So as I mentioned, we can always interpret our program going in both directions. So one thing we can ask is, does there exist some output for this input? Or we can ask, does there exist some input for this output? Similarly, uh, we can check invariance. So if we had an extra construct in our language that asserted that x is greater than 0 inside a loop, this would expand to a formula which, on top of being generated the way we did it in the previous slides, would also have an extra clause for each of x1, x2, x3, and so on that checks this assertion. And so, by the way, if you take a step back, what we're doing here is we're literally statically checking what is normally a purely runtime assertion. And the fact that we can actually do this practically, I think, is pretty cool and uh, unexpected. Now, similarly, verification, we can look for whether there is some input on which the two programs that are supposed to be the same are different. So if this formula is satisfiable, then the programs do not verify. And if it's not satisfiable, then they do. Now, the cool thing, as I said, is if we fail to verify, we get a counterexample. And kind of going a bit further afield, we can actually use this as part of a program synthesis loop to generate programs that match a certain specification. And so assuming we have some black box, which may or may not use Z3, to generate candidate programs for some set of inputs and outputs, we can do this kind of loop. We, we have a, a starting set of inputs and outputs. We generate a program. But because we might only have one or two starting pairs, the program is probably wrong. Then we go to verify. The verification fails, and it gives us a counterexample. So then we go back to our synthesizer, and now we have a new pair to test with. So now maybe we have three inputs, outputs, and we generate a program, and we do this loop again. And the cool thing is that in practice, for most problems, it only takes a handful of iterations to get a correct program, because each time that we fail to verify a a, a program, we find, we find a new counterexample, which kind of rules out an edge case in the 
uh, specification that we're trying to synthesize towards. And so uh, there are a couple of existing tools that take advantage of this kind of capability. And of course, one problem is usually it's really hard to scale the synthesis portion up beyond relatively small, small fragments of code. But we can expand the practical amount we can work with by letting the programmer write most of the program and just leave holes to fill in. And so there's a tool called Sketch, which does this for a Java-like language. And there's another really cool tool called uh, Syncwid, which has a sort of Haskell-like language with refinement types, and then uses the kind of program synthesis that I talked about to find programs that type check for these refinement types. And so this is a, a lot of fun to play with, and you can check it out uh, online. They actually have a, a, an interactive demo. Um, and then the final thing that I want to say for this general technique is that doing, building a formula compiler like this for a full-on general purpose language is a really large project unto itself. But if you have some kind of restricted DSL that has simpler semantics and smaller programs, you can put together a simple formula compiler in about as much effort as writing a simple interpreter. And this lets you build some pretty sophisticated tooling for your DSL with relatively little effort. And the other advantage that a lot of DSLs have is because they're expressed in domain terms, you can often find more efficient encodings for the program than you would if you were to first transform the DSL into a general purpose language and then encode the logic for that. So generally, I think this whole set of techniques is going to work a lot better in industry for relatively simple but important DSLs than it would for trying to build really powerful general purpose tools. Okay, and so that's it. Uh, any questions? It used a, a very similar kind of technique, but with a different kind of solver. And I'm not sure offhand, but I think that a lot of regular expressions uh, might not always be the best fit for SMD solvers specifically. But there's usually similar solvers you can explore uh, for t uh, tests like that. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Uh, so I have two questions about the program generation. So, yeah. synthesis and how well it generalizes? Uh, and the answer is that the reason that the programs generated by some synthesis system uh, are more likely to generalize is that the synthesis search is usually primed to find shorter, simpler programs. And so in practice, the, the way you set up the synthesizer should be a lot more likely logic that captures the behavior of your, your input-output pairs 
instead of just building a big lookup table. Uh, but that really depends on how you define and tune the synthesizer part of the loop. And I was kind of, the details I gave only really talked about how you would use the verifier to find more input-output pairs. And the practical difference, by the way, between this and traditional machine learning techniques is that these synthesis examples, when applied to programming by demonstration, uh, can produce useful results with maybe five input-output pairs, uh, where for machine learning to do something similar, you often need you know, five billion. So, uh, and then the second question was about using SMT solvers for doing some kind of algebra. So normal SAT solvers are not well suited for algebra because it's really hard, or maybe even impossible, to encode properties of unbounded integers in terms of pure SAT. Uh, but SMT solvers, some of the theories they offer are for unbounded integers. And so if you wanted to do some kind of algebra, that's what you would use. But I'm really not sure what the practical limitations are. So I don't actually know whether uh, a modern SMT solver is good enough to, for example, discover the quadratic formula. Uh, OK, other questions? More questions? Yeah. Turn it back. I, first of all, I think it needs to be a decidable theory. Oops. Another comment was, uh, I thought the problem talk was an algorithm. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. So uh, like, like, like what I like to say is like there's a really a continuum for constraint satisfaction going from really limited problems that are really easy to solve to arbitrarily you know, generalizable problems which can do arbitrary computation and are not undecidable. And SMT solvers are this very nice point in the middle where they're still fast enough to be useful but also general enough to capture a lot of interesting, interesting problems. Whereas Prolog in practice you can usually write the program you want, but it probably won't run quite as fast as you'd like. Okay, so I also have a question. Uh, I was wondering, are you familiar with abstract implementation? Uh, sure, but... What's the difference, or what can you compare it to? Uh, I mean, I'm not really sure how to answer that. I, I, I guess you could think of this formula compiler as like one way of doing uh, something a lot like abstract interpretation that you can then feed into an SMT solver. So. But I, I'm not really sure how to answer that, otherwise. Uh. There's one more question here. Um, so the, you, you said uh, 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 things about uh, unbounded integers. Yeah. Uh, so the, just uh, l let me uh, uh, correct me if, my, if I'm wrong. Your, uh, your example was uh, with the four, uh, uh, four operations, addition, sub subtraction, yep. multiplication. Let's say it's only for addition and subtraction. And then we define in that language multiplication as repeat, repeated uh, uh, adding. Mm -hmm. Would then an SMT solver be able to, 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 to conclusively show that you cannot divide by zero? Um, so, uh, I mean, I don't, yeah, I'm really not sure. I think it, it would depend on how you encode things, so I, I just don't know how to answer that. Okay. Uh, so we have time for one more? One more question, one short question, please, and then. So um, in Apple, there are these property-based testing libraries, which yep. kind of seem domain similar. Um, would it be possible to instead encode your properties as an SMT expression and have uh, Hedgehog or QuickCheck uh, more quickly generate bad input or shrink the input more effectively? Right, so there is kind of a, a connection with property-based testing. And the way I like to think about it, the, the kind of uh, invariant checking and verification I was talking about is essentially using the SMT solver to do property testing, but exhaustively. Right. So if you were using this kind of technique, if you could compile your program and your properties to SMT, then you wouldn't really need something like BookCheck or Hedgehog, because it would just exhaustively tell you whether the properties hold or not. Ah. Yeah. That must take strings. Right, that's a fair point. So like, by default, the SMT solver is just going to find some random counter example. But you could build an iterative tool that said, OK, can you find a counter example that is you know, smaller than x? Gotcha. And that's actually a, a pretty common technique is you, know, you find something, and then you keep on shrinking the bound until you don't find anything anymore. OK, good. Thanks again.